Welcome to today's Beyond the Sea webinar. There's an app for that. Tips to evaluate consumer apps for health. My name is Liz Waltman, the Outreach, Education, and Communications Coordinator for the Southeastern Atlantic Region. Before we begin with today's guest speaker, there are a few administrative details I am going to go over with you. As you are sharing, communicating, and asking questions in the chat box, please be sure to send to all attendees so that I, our guest presenter, and your colleagues can see your questions and information shared. During the session, there will be designated times where we pause for questions and comments, but there will also be time at the end to ask our speaker any remaining questions. If you need closed captioning for today's webinar, I will post the link to that in the chat box. This is the same URL that you currently see on your screen. Today, our guest speaker is Emily Hurst. Emily currently serves as the Deputy Director and Head of Research and Education for the Tompkins McCall Library at Virginia Commonwealth University and has over 10 years of experience in health science libraries. She oversees the operations of a diverse group of liaison librarians and ensures that the library meets the information needs of health sciences students faculty, and staff. In addition, she works closely with outreach efforts in the Richmond community and supports efforts of the Community Health Education Center to bring health information to the community. Having previously worked as the technology coordinator for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, South Central Region, Emily has a strong background in National Library of Medicine resources and has experience integrating these resources into educational settings. Everyone, please welcome Emily. Hi, welcome everyone. I am glad to be presenting to you all today and thank you, Liz, that was a great introduction. I want to just briefly say I have a cold, so I might sound a little bit different, uh, but I hopefully we'll make it through and I have water and things here in case that is necessary. And um, I do have Twitter accounts there if you'd like to tweet any of this, as well as the NNLM SEA. They would um, love to hear your feedback that way as well. And uh, for those of you that don't know where Virginia Commonwealth University is, I'm located here in Richmond, Virginia. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video now that you know that I'm real and I'm alive and I'm here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it off just because um, I'm going to be looking down at my notes in order to um, do this presentation for you today. But I wanted to thank you for joining us and I'll put my camera back on at the end when we have time for questions. There will be some activities during this presentation where I'll ask you to in, um, write your comments into the chat box. And then at the end, we can, you can also share your comments that way, and we can also unmute your microphones, um, or you can if you'd like at the end to ask me any questions directly. Thank you for joining us. All right, so what are we going to be doing? Um, some overview of some ob objectives that I have for us. Upon completion of the webinar, we will have an understanding of the difference between health and fitness and medical apps because there is definitely a difference, and uh, we'll learn a little bit about what makes those categories unique. And we'll also look at some criteria that you can use to evaluate health and fitness applications across mobile platforms. So I try to make this uh, platform agnostic so that the tips that I, I provide for you in this presentation can be used no matter what type of mobile device you have. And finally, at the end, I'll provide a list of some resources so that you can know what to go back to, to, to look for for more information so you can stay up to date on the latest in mobile apps uh, across the board, but there are some that link specifically to some health resources. So I mentioned this as one of our objectives. I know that as medical librarians, that uh, many of you might be joining me as medical librarians, some of you might be joining me as public librarians, some of you might be joining me just as interested parties. And um, what I wanted to tell you about here is just a little bit of a look at the categories. And this is, we'll, we'll talk more about when you download apps or where you purchase apps from. Um, mo 
those stores, either the Apple iTunes or Google Play for Android devices, they like to categorize their apps so that they're easier to um, locate. And there are two categories that may be of interest to you. And the first one people are kind of drawn to because it's called medical. And under this you can see a list of some of the medical um, topics that are, are some of the app categories, I'm sorry, some of the apps that are included under medical. And those include clinical references, drug calculators, uh, handbooks for healthcare providers, and journals, et cetera. There are some little icons down here at the bottom that also represent some of those. And these are really more of the apps that we would consider for our healthcare professionals or for individuals that might be studying medicine. That doesn't mean that they can't be downloaded by anyone. So I have a lot of these apps on my device so that I can talk to our, um, our the main people that I talk to in my position, um, the students, the faculty members, they might be using these apps. It helps me understand and know them. And there are some things in there that might be a little bit more advanced for someone that wants to learn about their own medical condition. They have the ability to download these apps as well. The ones that are going to be a little bit more of the focus for today's presentation are here on the right-hand side of the screen. We have health and fitness category, and these are the apps that are popular in what we would call consumer health. Um, the number one thing is really this personal fitness area, workout tracking, diet and nutrition. There are some things in there that talk about safety and health, and we'll um, have some examples of those apps as well. There's a lot of things that fall into this health and fitness category, and it's just more of a, an, a way to look at it as more of maybe the patient side of things. So that's just one thing I wanted to make sure we had an understanding of these two categories as we talk about mobile apps today. And why are we talking about mobile apps? Well, there is a lot of data out there, and um, this is actually taken from a 2000, the, the data I have at this first part is taken from a 2015 uh, survey that looked at um, individuals in the, in the United States, and it showed that about one in three of consumers had downloaded a, at least one health app, and that could have been health or medical, onto their smartphone or their tablet. So that's a pretty good one-third percentage that we're looking at, maybe even more since that was in 2015. And then the next part, I really enjoyed this study. The links are down here as well as in the um, resource section at the end, kind of take you through a place where you can find links to all of these. But this study was really great because it looked at mobile phone users and it showed that over 50% was actually like 58, um, almost 60% of mobile phone users had downloaded at least one health-related app. and then. What's more interesting and maybe more of importance for this presentation is that down here, you can the, the last little bullet point I have is that 427 of those individuals out of 934 had stopped using their health-related app. And this survey looked at the number, of the, the causes. Why did people stop using those apps? And I think this is really important for us to consider as information providers and um, information translators in some respect. What are the things that we can help individuals look out for before they download something. And these are some of the reasons why people stopped using them, data entry, loss of interest. Hidden costs is actually a big item. A lot of these apps are billed as free and then later on have additional costs to unlock new features. So those are some things that this presentation and some of these tips will help you be aware of. And then lastly, too confusing to use, and the app might have shared um, data with friends or connections. So those are some other design issues to take in mind as we look at mobile applications. And then again, what's driving this? Why are people downloading these mobile apps? Again, many of them are free. Um, and there are so many other devices and sensors out there now that allow you to connect and bring in more information, uh, Fitbit comes to mind, other sensors. People really are interested in this really, this anytime tracking, and they're also interested, of course, in diagnosis and the ability of possibly sharing this information and creating a stronger uh, relationship with their healthcare provider, their healthcare team. What can this information do to help their healthcare and their treatment options? So I have this uh, next slide up, and all the slides that are active, uh, interactive um, are going to be in this bright red color if you're able to see that. Um, if you want to type in the chat box, um, just looking at your own mobile device, thinking about your own use, 
how many apps have you downloaded that might be in the medical category, and how many apps might you have downloaded that are for health and fitness? Feel free to type in the chat box. I can tell you my results are skewed because I download a lot of these apps so that I can test them out and try them. And um, like I said, I use a lot of the medical apps to work with the students or the faculty members here at Virginia Commonwealth University. Okay, great. So we've got one medical, four medical, five fitness, great. Ah, Visual DX, yep, and I wonder if you're using that for yourself or maybe to talk to some of your constituents. Eight medical, Debbie, it's a lot. Five and five, great. And yeah, there's all types of reasons that people may um, be downloading these that may be for work. And if you're really into health and fitness, you might have a lot of those uh, health apps or those apps that fall into the fitness category. They have all kinds of things out there that can help you uh, track your uh, fitness in many different ways. Great. It looks like I don't, I see people that might have zero in medical, and that's okay. Uh, but I think no matter what, oh, Carol has zero and zero. So we do have somebody that does not have any apps. This might change your mind or give you some ideas about um, what to download if you have the type of phone or the type of mobile device that allows you to download. That's something else to keep in mind is that. If you don't have the device, you're not going to be able to necessarily use this, but maybe the information will be beneficial if you're working for working with one of your patrons or users. Thank you all for sharing. And looking at how many health how many um, health apps are out there, honestly, it's really hard to get a count um, or a, a up-to-date count from either of the major places that you download, either iTunes or the Google Play Store. Um, this data was from 2016. It was taken from a, a nice little um, a survey. And this actually kind of broke down the apps that were out there at the time. They counted an estimate of 165,000 in the iTunes Store alone. And so there are at least two popular stores. This was three years ago. So we can only guess that there are at least double possibly this number out there now um, when we look at both stores. But the reason why I wanted to share this chart, as you can see, that 36% are shown here as being in that wellness management or categorized as fitness, very popular category. Lifestyle and stress is also very popular, not surprisingly, possibly. Um, there are a lot of apps out there now that can help you with meditation, um, mindfulness, a lot of things have come up to help I'll help with that. And then this other portion, 12% diet and nutrition, so other um, areas of strong interest. When we look at the other side, uh, there are some apps that people have been downloading that are for specifically, especially chronic conditions, maybe disease-specific information. If you think about someone with diabetes, they might be tracking their blood sugars or their blood glucose. Uh, there's a small little sliver there, women's health and pregnancy. I'll make sure I point out an app for that. There is typically an app or several apps that will be popular uh, for women's health specifically. So lots of good information here, and that is from 2016, and just looking at a small portion of the apps that probably exist today. And so, I'm sorry, this is not an action slide, but it is a slide that I made this color because I think this kind of speaks to why this was important to me and possibly um, to you as other librarians. This is a quote from Art Papier, the CEO of Visual DX, which someone mentioned they were using, possibly for uh, working with other physicians. He mentions that it's important to distinguish between medical apps for consumers and those for professionals. They're of two different worlds. And you need to be cautious about apps that give people mistaken information, which is exactly what um, the next section we'll be looking at is some ways that you can appraise and evaluate um, apps that are out there. And I think that's the other thing to think about. Some are really designed for healthcare professionals and may, might put things at a higher level than what the um, consumer might be looking for. That being said, you know, we have many patients that are very well educated and very interested in their own health, and these apps that fall into the medical category might be appropriate for them. But it's really important to help and guide, and this is something that librarians have been doing for many years. It's kind of the heart of what we do. If you think of looking at and evaluating online health resources, 
or other resources in general. This is just going to be applying some of that information to the mobile application landscape. And I did want to mention that for, for this next part where we talk about the appraising of apps, I have also authored a piece that's in the Journal of Hospital Librarianship, and this kind of condenses the portion about um, some tips that you can use to evaluate apps from that piece, and, and it gives you a, a nice little framework to work with if you are trying to help someone that comes into your library or yourself um, find and download an app that would be appropriate. So these are just some tips that you can follow. And so we're going to start with our overview of appraising apps, part one. So one of the things I think we often fail to think about before we jump in, because it's so easy to do in that mobile landscape, you can actually just click on your mobile device and download the app and start using it on the device in hand. However, it's really important first to consider before we go through that, um, is there a, what is the need? What kind of need are we trying to get at? Do we need to download something or is there maybe an online resource that would be more appropriate? And so this is something that um, I ask you to look at before you even download any of the apps, you can actually do this appraisal process. So the first thing, looking at the need, what is it that this app is going to do that we need to download it for? Um, the second thing um, should be very familiar to most of us as librarians, who created this app? Who was the author? What is the authority that the app is referring to? So who made the app? Is there a link to other apps that they might have made? Or maybe they're a website, so you can kind of look at it as a storefront. And are they reputable? Hopefully some of these questions are starting to look familiar to you. They're usually the questions we ask ourselves about um, health information. And I'll be showing you in a moment where to find some of this particular information within the mobile stores or the app stores before you download it. And I have a comment on here about was the app FDA reviewed, approved or reviewed? So apps that are working with medical devices in some ways um, may be approved or reviewed by the, um, the FDA. So I'll ha I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this. It's, there's not as many apps out there as you would think. Uh, the FDA actually does not regulate apps, but they do regulate some that work with medical devices because that is in their purview. So um, that is something to be on the lookout for. They will mention that in their um, description if they are approved and working with a medical device. And timeliness. So when was this last, when was the app last updated? This is a great way to find out not only um, a little bit more about when the, the background of the app was adjusted, but also understanding maybe um, if the content was updated or if it was more of a fix to have the app work with the current um, platform. So your mobile devices are constantly being updated, and the apps, the technology that runs the app also has to be updated to kind of work with those mobile devices. And I'll show you on in just a moment where you can find uh, that information before you download what was done um, for an update. And a lot of these um, updates will also talk about security, and they'll, they might be addressing a flaw or something that was in the system. And these are some other things that we'll want to keep in mind before we download. So part two, on appraising devices, oh, I'm sorry, on appraising apps, um, I have mentioned here design. And so this is something that you're looking at information through a mobile app. You're using a very small interface to interact with that information. And I think earlier we saw on that slide, people stopped using an app because it was too complicated or it didn't make sense. So it's really important to take design into consideration and take our user into consideration as well. So does the design convey ease of use or simplicity? Think of somebody that might have mobility issues. Are there ways that they can still use the device or does it become too difficult to understand and use for them? 
Are the graphics and layout consistent? And do icons or buttons make sense? Some of these are in the, the vein of user experience and design. We hope that an app would follow those rules because it would help a user continue interacting with it. A lot of times I think about my um, individual in my family, my grandmother, and whether or not she would be able to make sense of it and keep using it if it was for her health information. And then security, this is an issue that um, is near and dear to my heart and um, is becoming more um, important every day. And are there security issues addressed in the description or updates? So I mentioned timeliness. Oftentimes the update section will mention whether or not a bug has been fixed or if there's a security update that has been added. And then a couple other things to keep in mind is whether or not you have to create an account to use the app. Um, and if you are doing that, if you're creating an account, do they have a privacy policy that you can view about what they're doing with your information? And then next, is there a privacy policy, which um, kind of ties into that. Do they tell you how they're using the data that you provide, especially if it's your health information? Are they sharing that or are they storing it for some reason to help the app work? And value. So how much does the app cost? I mentioned that there are free and there are apps that pay just to download them. But then you have apps that also have additional fees, what are now officially termed in-app in -app purchases. And the app might have been free to download and get onto your mobile device, but then as you are using it, you start seeing that it needs, um, you need to pay money to unlock a feature. And if that was a feature that you were very interested in, that's going to be an additional cost. So um, these fees can actually quickly uh, stack up and some apps are actually free to download but then have a monthly subscription service that allows you to access all of their features. So this is really important to take into mind before you download if you want to invest in the app itself. And finally, this is something that I like to mention just as an aside, um, a lot of people don't look at the reviews before they download things. And oftentimes, it's not 100% accurate, it's just that's why it's at the end of my appraisal sheet. It's always helpful to check here to see what other people are saying about the app. And I ask that you don't rely on the star rating alone. Both of the stores that most of these apps come from allow you to put you know, this is a five-star app or a two-star app, um, but actually read what people are saying um, because you might see that people say, I like it, but, and then kind of report some of the issues that they have seen. And also looking at reviews to see when they were posted. So some of them might have been posted um, very, uh, sorry, uh, much earlier than the current date. So some of those bugs that people are reporting might have been fixed. So just something that you can look at and just to be aware of before downloading it, uh, find out what a lot of the other users are saying. And this is my evaluation checklist that I have made, kind of condensing that information into this spreadsheet. And you can see we go through need, authority, timeliness, design, security, value, and reviews. And obviously you can just do a little yes, no, check, or you can make notes to yourself and does it have to meet the criteria in all of these categories? I would say no, um, but if you want the best quality app, you would hope to be able to address each of these things that are of importance to you or to the patron or user that you're assisting. And I think someone's asking about the PowerPoint. I think that Liz has that and can share it out uh, or post it following the presentation. All right, so this is my overview of the app stores. I'm just kind of referring to them gener generically, but I do show here, um, this is the iTunes store and then I will show a moment in a moment the Google Play. But these are screenshots that I've taken from the internet, so I have not downloaded anything in order to do this. You can actually visit itunes.apple.com slash us and you can actually find a list of their apps, you can search by category, and you can actually look before you leap and download an app. So they have actually streamlined this quite a bit so that both App Store and Google Play have very similar layouts. Um, so that is, 
one of the things that make comparing these across devices very easy. You can find the information under very similar categories. And the first thing we talked about was need, um, of course, to address whether or not you need an app. Do you need this fitness app? Seven-minute workouts are very popular, and this is something that's supposed to guide you through it from Johnson & Johnson. So let's kind of move past that and say we addressed our need. So who created this app? I have a nice square here. Um, oh, I have a pointer somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. No, I don't have a pointer. Oh, I do. No. One moment. No. I know I have a device that I can do this with. Well, I can't find it, but I'm going to keep talking as I look for it. Oh, maybe this is it. Uh-huh. I think I have a laser pointer now. Um, as you look at your, uh, your app, you see the title at the top. It tells you a little tagline. It also tells you here what ages it would be appropriate for, I believe. And that's a little hard to read. Um, and then right below that, you can see the creator. So what is the authority? In this case, it's Johnson & Johnson Health and Wellness. And this is actually a URL. So I recommend to anyone that when you're coming to something and you don't know um, who this entity is or what this entity is or what gives it authority, if you'll click on that, it will actually take you to other apps that they have created. And down at the bottom of the page, we have a section called information. It will take you out to additional information about the developer here if you'd like to see more about who owns the app or who developed it. This second section is the information section. It's at the very bottom of both Google Play and the App Store. But here you can find out that it's in the health and fitness category. There is a nice little thing here where it tells you the size of the app. So some apps are very large because they're going to download a lot of content to your device. And so if you're someone that is, has a limited amount of storage or memory on your device, that might be something that you have a concern about and want to consider maybe looking for a smaller app. Uh, there's a great feature here on compatibility. So as you can see, we're in the App Store. So all of the devices listed are Apple products. And you can also see which operating system it requires. And this, these are just other features and things to know about if you're working with someone, they want to download something, you can find out if their device is compatible with what you're looking for. Age rating, it says four plus, so a four-year-old um, would be able to download or use. And the price is actually free. And that is something I don't see on this this app. Um, if there were additional fees to be paid, there is typically an ad that says, or a, a little designation that says in-app purchases. And that's because they have to let you know ahead of time, before you download it, that there are going to be some paywalls that come into effect. And like I mentioned before, developer website, and here is our wonderful privacy policy. A lot of good stuff down here at the bottom, and that relates to our security question. And then the reviews in the App Store, easy to find. They're actually before that information section. You can see the number of ratings. So that's the number of people that have downloaded the app and are giving it a review. And you can see that there's one from 2017, 2019, 2018. Um, you can actually click on those to expand them and get more. And then here are your star ratings. And like I was saying, just looking at these is a nice visual cue, but it's good also to read the comments that people have made and maybe the issues that they ran into. And then we look at Google Play. This is the same kind of thing I was mentioning before, the look before you leap. It's the same app. So again, you have all the same features. You have links that'll take you to more apps that Johnson & Johnson has created. You have uh, the number of people that are rating it here. You have a quick link to install. And their section is called additional information. Here you can actually see when it was updated. And I believe in Google Play, as well as in the App Store, you can typically get some information about what happened during these updates, what the update um, provided, what it did for that app. And some of them may be just security fixes, some of them may be technical fixes, but they usually provide a little bit more information. I may have cut it here for my screenshot because it's difficult to show. Um, current version requires Android, what the size is, 
This is also a nice um, look, installs. This actually tells you the number of people who have also installed this app. The content rating is for everyone, so there's nothing in here that would be inappropriate for audiences, which I believe is what the four plus means on the other in Google Play, or I'm sorry, in the, I stu uh, the App Store. Um, that is a content rating, more or less, trying to let you know that the content's appropriate for almost anyone. Um, you have the ability down here at the bottom, you can actually visit the, the developer's website. You have an email in this case and a privacy policy, so you can actually contact them or review a policy. And finally, in both of the stores, they typically have a way for you to report. The Google Play Store just makes it a little bit easier. If you find an app that has errors or has problems, you can let those that manage the site know more about it. And finally, at the middle of the page for the reviews, you also have the star ratings and some of the written reviews that you can see what um, people are saying. And here's a person that had a bad experience, possibly because it didn't work with an update that they, that they had done. The other thing that I wanted to mention about these, um, we mentioned design in our character, in our description, in our checklist. And one of the things I did not mention, I did not show here, is that in both App Store and Google Play, you can actually, you're actually required to show a screenshot of what your app looks like. And we'll see that in just a moment. But this is a good way for you to tell whether or not uh, the screen and the design look like something that would be appropriate for you or your audience. So you can actually look at it. And then the other thing that I like to double check is if you do download it, does that screenshot match what you are using and downloading? Because the screenshots are typically submitted ahead of time to get your apps in the store and get them um, up for sale, essentially. So that's something that's required on the behalf of the stores, Google Play and the App Store. Okay, before we get into this, I just want to make sure if there are any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. I'll try to address them. Um, we'll also have time at the end, so if you'd like to hold on to your question, you can also take care of it then. But our next activity, I'm just going to talk about it as you think about your questions that you might have. Um, Oh yes, how do you determine if an app is 508 compliant? That is a great question. I'm going to write that one down and I'm going to come back to it at the end because there's not necessarily a tried and true way to do that without downloading it. Okay, so I wrote that one down and I'll definitely make sure I address it in more detail at the end. As far as I have seen in the Google Play and the App Store, if they do have accessibility um, op options, they try to point that out in the descriptions of some of the apps. So that is something to keep in mind. It does not happen for all the apps. It's more of something that they do because they, they know that this audience and that users are interested in that so they, and they might have an app that's very compatible for people with disabilities. All right, so evaluating an app. I am actually, we're going to go through and evaluate an app. So if we'll think of that spreadsheet or that, yeah, that spreadsheet that I shared earlier, I'm actually just going to show some screenshots from a um, Google Play or Android, I'm sorry, Google Play or the App Store. I have to keep them straight. Um, and they're for an app that actually does exist. And I'm going to ask you to kind of rank it and to share your comments in the, in the chat box as we go through. So first off, I want to set you up with the scenario. And you can read it here, but essentially you have a distressed patron. She's very tired. She has a baby that keeps crying. And she's heard, as many of us have heard from our friends, there's an app to help you translate baby cries. She wants you to tell her if the app will work and to help her download it. And, you know, that's a scenario that some of us may have had in any library situation, and it may not be for baby crying, it may be for something else, um, but essentially there is a need that's being addressed, and you're able to, like I said, search iTunes or Google Play, and there is an app that comes up, and it's called Baby Cries Translator. And this is the actual description of this app. 
It is the first commercial app, APP in all capital letters, has the ability to learn and identify the needs and cries of infants within six months old, including hunger, sleepiness, pain, and wet diapers, which can help novice parents understand why babies cry. So if we're addressing the need question, does this app appear to do what we want? Feel free to type what you think in the box. Yep, all I guess, yep. We're definitely getting some good feedback about uh, this app seems to address what we would like it to do. Um, let's find, now it's time to dig a little bit deeper. We can go further into the evaluation. Yes, so in our next slide, um, I had someone actually mentioned this. So we're gonna look at the authority now. So it seems to do what we think, um, but now we're gonna look at authority. So who created the app and are they reputable? So under Baby Cries Translator, it says that the, um, it's Chang Shu Yang uh, is listed here. That's a link that you can go to. And I'm trying to avoid looking at ratings and things like that right now. Um, but you can see that this person created it. <clears throat> you might actually do a Google search. This is something I've done in the past. So um, you might see a name there or something that doesn't give you a lot to go on, but then you search on Google or you search maybe a database and see if you find, <coughs> excuse me, other information. You follow that link and that does not go to anything. But you do have this nice little um, comment that someone has mentioned already that um, we cooperated with a pediatrician at the National Taiwan University and as a librarian. I'm doing some research on the backside. I'm looking to see if that is a, a location that exists. I like your feedback. I'm going to just take a drink of water myself on mute for just a moment. Okay, I think I'm back now. So again, Digging deeper, I think that sounds like a great idea, Debbie. <clears throat> My apologies, I am coughing in the background. Yes, we're getting some um, hints of not trusting what we're seeing so far. And yeah, I actually did. I looked to see if this university even existed. All right. So timeliness is our next feature on the um, evaluation check checklist. So let's look at timeliness. According to what's provided in our store, the app was last updated in May of 2017. And there's not additional information provided here about what that update did. So I don't really like that. I'd prefer to see something that tells me a little bit more about what type of things happened with this update. Was it just to make it compatible with the latest version of the operating system? Or did they add new content? Did they do something new to it? 2017 is quite old if it is a medical app. I think you should um, you know, look at it as, as well about the things that are going on in the, the field on how often we update medical literature, as well as how often our mobile devices are updating. Okay, and I mentioned this earlier, this is an example of the screenshots that are provided for every app. So they typically have some views of what the app should look like in action. It looks um, and feel free to put what you'd like in the chat box, but does the app appear easy to use? Do the icons make sense? Oh, 
It does. It seems a little busy. Possibly it's for a baby. There's cute icons, right? It's going to ask you to, it looks like it's going to ask you to input some baby information, that use some symbols. appears to make sense there. So it seems to be checking our, our checklist on design for the most part. So we go on. When we look at security, so what kind of information can we find out about the security? Do I need to make an account? Does the app um, access or share my data? It's going to record the baby crying. Does it keep it? Um, with whom is the data shared? And is there a privacy policy? So there is a Gmail account there where you can email to imruk at taiwan at gmail.com. And there is a privacy policy and a website that you can visit. And you try to visit the privacy policy link, which I did, and it did not respond because um, the website was non-responsive. <clears throat> so what do we all think? Yep, no response, no use. Yes, it can be a little alarming if you find something that looks very reputable and then you try to find out a little bit more about it, but you start seeing that there's not a lot of information out there. And value. So I hid this part from you when you looked at it the first time. You just saw Baby Cries Translator. But the app actually costs $2.99. It does not indicate that there are additional fees or in-app purchases, but there is still a cost to download and start using this app. So what do we all think about that? Yeah, and this is something else to keep in mind. You know, there are a lot of apps that are out there. If you find something that has a cost, it might be worth just checking to see if there's an alternate version or from another provider that's reputable that does something similar and maybe has no cost or maybe has a trial period that you can use. And then somebody asked here, I'm writing that one down too, about the App Store and the reviews. So I'll get through that to that one in just a minute there, Mary Kay. All right, and our last little um, item that I like to have people look at are the reviews, sometimes the most telling. Um, and some of these, I don't think there's anything too inappropriate on the board, but uh, you can see out of the individuals that have given it uh, a rating, it's only two stars, most of those falling in the one star category. People cannot use the app, it won't open, it won't record, it doesn't do what it claims, please refund. So these are some red flags for sure. And I appreciate the feedback here. Does not do what it advertised, yep. And 131 less than one star reviews, not a good idea to purchase it. So I don't think, um, you're happy to, happy to have you keep typing in the box, but it sounds like we're a little unsure about this and we probably would not recommend it to our patron that came in. However, we might want to look at what else might be out there. She has a baby. It's a new baby. Maybe there are other apps that might be more appropriate and she's a first time parent possibly. There are other apps that we can look for or search for that might be useful. And I'll show you one that is always very popular. It does have a cost associated with it as well, but it tends to be one of the more popular apps for newborns. And it might be something to consider. All right, and that's the other thing I try to help people think about is, yes, there may be an app for that, but a lot of times these apps are developed out of fun, out of play, and what's luckily um, that has happened now is that there used to be many apps out there that were claiming to be able to measure your blood pressure by scanning your eyes, by listening to your breath, and these kind of things are or can be a little scary and dangerous, because they may put a consumer or a patient at risk if they're relying on something that is unreliable. And luckily for us, there is a way that you can report the apps that may be inappropriate. 
and hopefully those apps are not getting into the store because of the review process that should take place. Um, so a lot of the apps that are out there that may have once been listed as health and medical or health and fitness and medical because they were going to measure heart rate, et cetera, they may actually be now in the like fun and games category because what they do or what they claim to do is not appropriate or accurate. And so it's um, nice to see that those actions have been taken and that was actually thanks in part to some um, individuals that provided information and feedback to iTunes about how dangerous some of this might have been. We're at our last 15 minutes, so I want to make sure I save some time for you all to um, provide questions, but I wanted to go over some apps that I can recommend here based on either my um, evaluation of them or use and just looking at some of the things that are popular since you might have questions about that. So the um, free apps on the left, these are what are I'm listing as popular. They were either in the top 100 apps in health and fitness at one point or they are, um, I'm sorry, they were either in the top 100 apps of all time at one point and that, that is a continuous um, updated list of the top apps that are happening and they continue to be some of the top apps in their category, health and fitness. So Fitbit, again, I mentioned that one because it interacts with another device. People are very interested in working out and um, the Sweatcoin app, it sounds terrible, um, but it works with the Apple Watch and it's a kind of a fancy pedometer. It converts steps into points so people can purchase items. And then the last one down here is Calm. And this is an app that's free, but I believe it has in-app purchases now where you actually have to pay to open new content, but it does have some free content that allows for um, meditation and breathing. And so these are apps that have risen to the top and become popular over time. On the right, these are paid apps, and there is again a list of the top paid apps. And these are the top apps that are coming into the category of health and fitness, seven minute workouts. It's not just this one, there are several of them that are out there. You can see that this one's $3.99 plus in-app purchases, but they usually come with videos and how-tos so that you can work out. The same thing with full fitness, lots of videos that you can watch, but you can track progress. And finally, Wonder Weeks is what I was mentioning um, that might be a more appropriate app to refer someone to. It's $2.99, but if you put in baby information and then um, you can track what um, is going on with the baby and its development. And there's a lot of tips and it's also related to a series of books. So just some popular apps that are there. I wanted to make sure I mentioned them. The other area where um, I don't have an app mentioning this in this shorter presentation, but um, women's health was of um, high importance and there are apps that are typically tracking in the top 100 that have to do with fertility tracking or cycle tracking for women. And that's something that may be of interest to your um, patrons as well. And just wanted to let you know that that's a very popular topic. <clears throat> with either device, the iPhone devices or with the Android devices, there are two built-in um, app, um, apps. Excuse me. <clears throat> the iOS Health is automatically available on any of the Apple devices. You can actually put in a medical ID. It works with your smartwatch and it's a built-in pedometer as long as you're carrying the phone. And it also works with several other um, apps as well. Google Fit allows you to do some fitness tracking for free online and it acts as a connector with several other apps as well. <clears throat> General health topics, I wanted to make sure I mentioned uh, Medline Plus, which is not an app at all. It's actually a mobile responsive site, so there's nothing for you to download, but you would need to visit and have, you would need to have access to the internet, and then you can visit medlineplus.gov. It should know that you're on your mobile device and then make the screen smaller and more uh, user friendly as far as that design goes for um, use on a mobile device. And you can also get into the Spanish language version, watch videos, do all the cool stuff that you can do on MedlinePlus.gov, but in a smaller version or smaller uh, landscape size. Uh, I just wanted to mention 
first aid, because this is another thing that falls into health and fitness, the American Red Cross offers a whole series of apps on their website. They're all free to download. Two of the most popular are first aid, which actually walks you through some first aid tips. There's lots of photos. There is not photos, but more like um, illustrations. So it's not as frightening. And um, it also has some quizzes that you can take to help you get prepared. And there is a whole category or a whole app dedicated to pet first aid. On the right, this is Kids Doc. It's from the American Academy of Pediatricians. It only costs $1.99 to download. And what's nice about it is it provides first aid information specifically for children. So there are some things to notice about that, um, that are um, health related for children that are different than providing um, first aid to an adult. Like, I, like you have seen, running and fitness is very uh, of interest to people in this category. Runtastic is something that works with fitness trackers. You have all the map, my, run, walk, fitness, which come to us from Under Armour, but they're all available for free, and they do tie in to um, other devices or other accounts. And I do mention premium features here, which mean that you'd have to pay to get access to some of those. Diet and nutrition, both of these, um, MyFitnessPal, which also comes from Under Armour and Calorie King, have websites that you can actually use without downloading the app. Just having the app makes it a little bit easier to do some of these things on the go. Um, my favorite thing here is about the MyFitnessPal. You can actually use the camera on the phone to scan a barcode, and then if you are tracking calories, it can import it into your diary for the day so you can see how you are tracking your food. These um, last three apps here, EHRs, um, electronic health records, personal health records, actually fall into the category of medical, you can see right here. So they are not, they're not called health and fitness, but if you are seeing a primary care physician or if you're going to a clinic they, um, that uses eClinical Works, they actually have an app that allows you to have access to their EHR and to interact with your provider, and that is called Hilo. The care zone is really nice for someone that might be a caregiver. It allows you to track a lot of the medications and keep journals, to-do lists. And again, it's falling under that category of medical because of the information that it's gathering. And then if you're doing lab tests from Quest Diagnostics, they actually have a way for you to get in and see your results, but then also learn a little bit more about those lab results. You can also do that through Medline Plus, but it's built in here so that you don't have to go to another site through the app for my quest for patients. The other thing to mention is that telemedicine is becoming very popular now, getting help from a physician through your mobile device. And um, those apps are typically found if they are available through um, the medical category, just because of the nature of the information that's being provided. And lastly, um, here I mentioned gamifying health. This is just making health fun and health and fitness fun. Uh, some of you might already know about Zombies Run. It really helps you um, get motivated to run. It plays very dramatic music. My Sugar is something that helps people with diabetes by making learning about diabetes fun and interesting and also allowing you to earn points and badges. And then finally, this is an award-winning app from the American Red Cross called Monster Guard. It's a role-playing game, and it helps um, children, essentially uh, teens, uh, pro learn emergency preparedness scenarios. So it's a fun way to use apps to learn about health and fitness and, and possibly medicine. And this is going to be your take-home homework, um, and that is to think about how your library users find and use apps and what your library could do to kind of change that conversation or become part of that conversation. Some examples down here um, that are just things that I have seen before are library app recommendations, kind of like we do with books, but with apps. And someone's mentioned social media posts, and maybe thinking about our programming in our libraries, can we incorporate apps into those? Uh, there might be a way to do that. So think of some other um, ideas. Someone's um, sharing some ideas here. And I wanted to make sure you saw my last slides have either where I got the information from or some short lists of where you can find um, more um, health and wellness app reviews. 
iMedical apps is back in business. They have a little hiatus, but they have a lot of information, especially if you are looking for things for um, healthcare providers. It's a little bit more advanced, but they do provide some alerts, especially if there are um, apps out there that might be causing issues that are um, apps to watch out for, essentially. National Library of Medicine, of course, has their whole gallery of apps and sites, and those are all available for free. They have many topics that you can download. The um, disaster information um, apps for your go bag are also great if you're looking at disaster health and safety. Those are kind of taken to a different area. And then this is not from the US, but it's from the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. And they have a nice list. Some of these apps are available in the US, some are not. But they are actually evaluating apps and providing nice reviews about how they work and additional information for them. It's a really interesting experiment. There's um, apps in there now. When I first started talking about this, there were no apps in there. So they have added content. And then resources, again, iMedical apps. Moby Health News is a great resource for anything mobile. App Advice provides a lot of lists and um, rankings for apps. PC Magazine does a good job with app reviews. And then all the links provided in this presentation can, and more uh, can be found here on this Google Doc that I have shared at the bottom. And my contact information, I'm sorry to rush through all that. I think I did myself in by having a couple coughing times, um, but I am overcoming a cold. So here's my contact information. Feel free to let me know if you have any questions or let Liz and the folks at the SEA know, and I'll be happy to get in touch with you. I think she'll be providing, um, can I put the link in the chat? Possibly. Give me just one second to do that. Um, and if there are any questions, if you'd like to unmute yourself or type in, I will try to get to them. Someone had mentioned, as I'm doing all this, I'm going to think back to the question somebody had about how our apps um, added to the store, and they do have a development process that they have to go through from the um, the develop. I'm sorry, from the either from Apple or from Google, they have a whole series of requirements that they must meet, and um, those do not. Those are all. Um, it's kind of proprietary how all that happens, but they do provide a list for. Um, what is required before something can go into the store. A lot of it has to do more with, and that is the link, there you go, to um, working appropriately on the devices, as they say. Um, where is a good place to find a list of free medical apps? That's a great question. It depends on what you're looking for. I think if we go back to my list, you know, there's a lot of stuff from the National Library of Medicine that'll all be free our medical apps will not also will not necessarily be free but they have a good list of information and if you just want to go through the stores you can actually click on that category health and fitness and you can see all the top trending apps and then go through that evaluation process that we talked about so you can find them categorized there and then it's a matter of um, doing some evaluative kind of look and work to decide if they would be appropriate for you. I'm just scrolling up to see if there's any more questions. Depending on the app, is it possible to synchronize the information between different devices? Yes, it depends on the app though, Carol. You are absolutely correct, um, especially if you have um, if you have like all Android devices or if you have all Apple devices and you log in with the same account, you should be able to, for some apps, start doing something on one and then finish doing something on another. However, if you're just looking up things, that might not necessarily work. It might just be that you have to start that whole process again. But if you were actually in, a, in an activity, it should let you continue. I'm checking the chat, but Liz, if, I think you ha if you had things that you need to do for a conclusion, I know we're running up to the top of the hour, so. Yes, thank you, Emily, for a great presentation. Um, I just have a few last minute administrative details to finish out this uh, webinar today. So as a reminder, today's presentation was recorded and will be posted on the NNLM YouTube page as soon as possible. 
I encourage you to subscribe to the page as you will be notified as new recordings are made available. Um, I'll go ahead and share a link in the chat box now, but once the recording is available on YouTube, most likely within the next week, I will email everyone who pre-registered for today's webinar a link to the recording as well as a PDF of all the presentation slides. And our next webinar coming out of the SEA region is a nursing liaison's role in evidence-based practice, and it is scheduled for Thursday. <laughs> it is scheduled for Thursday, April 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Oh, it keeps Sorry. changing. Sorry, that's my fault. I clicked on the wrong thing. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So our guest speaker that day will be uh, Emily's colleague from VCU, Roy Brown, and this webinar will focus on identifying key roles and strategies librarians can employ to support nurses in implying evidence-based practice to patient care. So I'll drop a link to that class page in the chat box, but you can also always find webinar availability on nnlm.gov. And finally, to evaluate today's webinar and to receive your MLACE credit, please visit the link on this slide, which I will also drop in the chat box. After you've completed the evaluation, you will receive instructions on how to claim MLACE credit through the MedLibEd website. This link will also be included in that email I send to pre-registrants pre in the next week or so. So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and a huge thank you to Emily for your time and insight. Um, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you all.